Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. I thought we would continue with the suggestions past the developers for December of 2021, but we're going to split some of the aviation parts in parts. The reason for this is because the ones that they've actually picked for the aviation stuff, very similar to the ground stuff, are quite big, meaning that there is a lot of information on them and uh, there is a lot of documentation on them. So doing them all in one video would mean the video would probably be a couple of hours long. And even though I normally am um, told a lot of the time that I do really long videos, that, at least for me, is a little bit too long. So today we're going to be having a look at one of the past developers and then on top of that as well, the new authentic decals are out. So I'll do a video on them tomorrow just to let you guys know they are available now. And also uh, it is being celebrated the birthday of the MiG-17 from the 14th of January to the 16th of January. All you have to do is get either 20 AB kills or 10 RB uh, or SB kills in either the MiG-17 MiG-17 AS, the Shenyang F5 or the J4 and you can get yourself a 10 to 30% RP or SL booster for 3 to 10 battles. Uh, so make sure to do that, it's another one of those Memorial Day events and uh, it basically means that you can get yourself some cool stuff. At the same time, they've also um, got the pack for the MiG-17 AS which is on sale right now. It is $50. Uh, for the MiG-17 AS, which is a rank 5 premium for the USSR, the 2000 GE, and also 15 days of premium account. If you want to buy it, make sure to use my affiliate code. Um, you'll get a 3% discount, and also you'll get my decal in the game. But I would actually advise not to buy this. And uh, the reason is, is because the MiG-17 AS is in a really rough place right now when it comes to its matchmaking. Around 9.0, uh, I've been playing quite a lot and what ends up happening is you get sucked into the 9-7 bracket where there's a lot of very powerful machines and your vehicle is just not good enough. Uh, if you get down to it, it's an incredibly good vehicle. It works insanely well, but in those 9-7-8-7 matches, 9-3-8-3 matches, it does tend to struggle against the vehicles that are higher than it. So the first aircraft when it comes to the suggestions past the developers for December of 2021 is for America and it is the General Dynamics F-16A Fighting Falcon. Now, the reason why this uh, vehicle gets its own video is because a lot of the article is copy and pasted from many other websites. So that means there's a ton of useless information here. And I thought what I would do is I would sit down and I would go through it all. So you have all of the information just like how you would have to anyway. So let's get started on, first of all, the history of the F-16 project. The prototype was the YF-16. It was launched in Fort Worth on the 13th of December 1973 and it was airborne by the C-5A to Edwards Airfield Base on the 8th of January 1974. Its first flight was a short jump unintentional around the standard of 21st January 1974 at the hands of the test driver Phil Ostricher. By the way, uh, because this has actually been translated from a different language, there is a bunch of words missing and it is really hard to read. So enjoy. Uh, John G. Williams, who's the structural engineer of the flight tests of the prototype, recalls that during the first high-speed taxi test, a violent lateral oscillation was established as a direct result of pilot-driven oscillations, several maximum left and right commands. When the airplane reached spin speed of approximately 120 knots, remember, this was the first plane to have a fixed lever, and there was no opportunity for Phil to notice the plane until the high-speed taxi test. When the nose of the aircraft rose, the tail inadvertently scraped the, the trail. The left-hand missile and the static probe of the right tail also came in contact with the runway slightly and Phil decided to take off because the bird had begun to divert to the left side of the lane, and he came across plowing the desert or flying. Luckily, he chose to fly and possibly save the entire program. 
and after taking off, Phil regained control and stayed awake for six minutes and landed uneventfully. Before the next flight, the arm sensitivity was reduced by 50% with the gear reduction, and later, after complaints of insufficient sensitivity, he returned to the original. The first scheduled flight was delayed until a new right stabilizer could be installed, and it eventually took place on the 2nd of February 1974, again with Phil Ostricher at the controls. It reached 400 miles per hour and also 30,000 feet. Then there was YF number 2. It was flown for the first time on the 9th of May 1974, with test pilot Neil Anderson at the controls. On two occasions during these early test flights, the F-100 engine went uncommanded idle while in flight, forcing a dead stick landing. Temporary flying restrictions were imposed on the YF-16 until the problem had been corrected, and the fault was traced to contamination of the fuel control valve, which caused the valve to jam in the idle position. But while the curbs were in effect, the YF-16 had to remain within dead stick landing distance of the airfield. A fly-off between the YF-16 and the Northrop YF-17 began as soon as flight testing started. The two YF-16s reached speeds of over Mach 2, maneuvers achieving 9G and altitudes above 60,000 feet. And although the YF-16 was designed for 6.5G at full internal fuel, 9G capability at reduced fuel loads and non-critical Mach altitude combinations allowed the YF to easily demonstrate the advantages of the higher G in air combat and to verify the effects of the 30-degree inclined seat. There was an attempt to get as many pilots as possible to fly both the YF-16 and the YF-17. The lightweight Pfizer prototypes never flew against each other, but they did fly against all current USAF fighters, as well as against MiG-17s and MiG-21s that had been acquired by the USAF. Within the Air Force team, there was a strong institutional bias against the LWF once they realized that it was a threat to the F-15 program. To avoid some of these suspicions, the program was renamed to the Air Combat Fighter by the Department of Defense. Meanwhile, the governments of Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway had begun considering possible substitutes for the Lockheed F-104G Starfighter. They formed the Multinational Fighter Program Group to choose the successor. The main candidates were Northrop's YF-17, Dassault Mirage F-1, the Saab JA-37 Vigan, and General Dynamics YF-16. The ACF contest winner would probably be the favorite candidate for the MFPG, wanted to see if the USAF would buy the plane before making a decision. These countries wanted the USAF decision until, de until December 1974. Meanwhile, some U.S. Navy officials were expressing interest in a low-cost alternative to the Grumman F-14 Tomcat, which at the time was experiencing serious initial problems and suffering from a number of surplus costs. This program came to be known as VFAX. A blatant version of the Tomcat, called the F-14X, was proposed by Grumman, but was summar uh, summarily rejected by the Department Secretary of Defense. On the 10th of May 1974, the House Armed Services Committee dictated that the VFAX would have to be a brand new aircraft, but apparently having forgotten the sad experience of the F-111, they wanted the USAF and the Navy to basically buy the same plane. However, the Navy, unlike the Air Force, wanted the VFAX to be able to fill the air-to-air -air and ground attack roles. In August of 1974, Congress raised money for the VFAX and diverted it to a new program known as the Navy Air Combat Fighter and determined that the aircraft would make the most of the USAF LWF slash ACF hardware and technology. It would basically be a navalized LWF ACF. However, most Navy officers were solidly committed to the F-14 and did not want anything with the VFAX or the NACF. However, Congress was insistent, and in September of 1974, the Navy announced that it would select a single contractor to initiate the NACF engineering development and solicited industry proposals. 
In response to this request, on the 27th of September 1974, General Dynamics announced that it would join Ling Temco Vought to propose a YF-16 based NACF project. The navalized YF-16 should have a BVR radar, which was not part of the original planning of the F-16 USAF. If both the Air Force and the Navy chose the YF-16, General Dynamics would be the Air Force's top contractor and LTV would be the Navy's main contractor. However, in retrospect, since both contractors were located in the same state, there was little likelihood of receiving a contract. In October of 1974, Secretary of Defense James R. Schlesinger announced that he was considering the production of the ACF contest winner to meet USAF, Navy, and export requirements. Until that time, the LWF ACF program had been largely an academic exercise for the USAF. The design emphasis would now be changed to that of a multifunctional aircraft. This would complement rather than uh, complement... This would complement, rather than complement, the F-15 Eagle in the USAF service, somewhat relieving Air Force fears that the ACF would somehow defect its uh, Eagle program. The LWS pr production form, now strictly known as the ACF in Department of Defense press releases, would have a larger radar antenna, giving the vehicle some BVR capability. The USAF announced plans to buy 650 ACFs, with the possibility that this order could be increased to 1,400 or more. This move was designed to assure potential NATO customers that the USAF would be firmly behind the new fighter. And then on the 13th of January 1975, Air Force Secretary John McLucas announced that the YF-16 had been selected as the winner of the ACF contest. The Air Force placed a contract for 15 FSD, or full-scale development, airframes, but single and two-seat versions would be built, with the single seat being designated the F-16A and the two-seater F-16B. The reason given by the Secretary of the, for the decision was the lower operating cost, lower longer range, and better transient maneuverability of the YF-16. Another advantage of the YF-16 over the YF-17, as far as the Air Force was concerned, was the fact that the F-100 turbofan of the YF-16 was the same power plant as that of the F-15, and it was felt that buying more of these engines would advance the cause of the fighter that it really wanted, the F-15. Political considerations also played a role, since the F-111 program came to an end, General Dynamics at Fort Worth needed the F-16 order to stay in business. In the meantime, the F-16 still remained one of the contenders for the NACF order. One proposal from General Dynamics was for a single-seat naval fighter based on the two-seat F-16B, but the space ordinarily occupied by the rear seat being used for increased avionics or fuel. On the 2nd of May 1975, the Navy announced that they had decided not to buy the navalized F-16, but opted instead for an aircraft developed from the YF-17, which was eventually to be emerged as the McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 Hornet. In February of 1975, the NATO consortium was offered the F-16 at a unit flyaway cost of $5.16 million, based on a total production run of 2,000 planes for the USAF, NATO, and also other countries. At the same time, the US government announced that it had cleared F-100 engine uh, technology transfer to these countries. And uh, basically, that is how the story goes. Then, if we actually have a look at those other countries, Neil Anderson's belly landed the second prototype on the grass in front of GD on the 8th of May 1975 while doing a practice show before in Paris. On takeoff, he made what was then a unique maneuver. Almost when the wheels left the ground, the gear was pedaled, the aircraft was placed in a 270-degree bearing and immediately placed in a 9G in a turn. 
Unfortunately, one of the tires was slightly unbalanced, and this combined with the abnormal torque of the gear being on a roller caused one of the main gear、uh, tires to jam on the ledge when it got into the wheel well. Neil had no choice but to put the wheels up and then、uh, and put them on the floor. Uh, right in front of thousands of GD employees and their families, he was not injured, but damages to the hand-built prototype was too expensive to repair. According to John Williams, Neil's landing was more embarrassing than usual. The day before, during an aerial practice show, the landing gear struck a small holder on the wheel and knocked him down. No one thought much about the reason, but they were worried, especially in preventing that from happening again. So what did they do? Strengthen the armband, of course. Then the next day, when the gear hit again on the bracket, she leaned against it for a longer time and tried to release the equipment, but ran out of fuel. A little over five gallons were found in the tanks after the landing. There was the USAF KC-135 sitting at the end of the runway on alert, with the engines running, but was not authorized to take off because he was overweight. It probably did not matter because the equipment was well attached with the support. However, in May of 1975, the first YF-16 made its first transatlantic flight for a sales tour to its potential NATO customers and made an appearance at the Paris Air Show. On the 7th of June 1975, armed with the insurance of the USAF commitment to the type, Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway announced that they had agreed to acquire the F-16 as replacements for their F-104Gs. A total of 348s were in the initial production contract. In its new form, the F-16 offered more new technology, superior performance, and a more attractive offset production package than its competitors. Initially, there was some criticism of the lack of BVR and all-weather capability of the F-16, as well as some concern with the performance issues of the F-100 engine, which was encountering some at the time. Now we're going to look at the rest of the article, and I want to see if you can、uh, pick up on what I picked up when I was reading this through for the third time, and、uh, the issues that the article may have. So anyway, let's get into it. The F-16 is a plane to dogfight par excellence. Combined small size with admirable acceleration, ramp ratio, and cornering performance, has the maneuverability features that allow it to execute violent maneuvers without major concerns for the pilot, and both can incorporate new equipment for alternative actions as it absorbs major structural changes in order to explore other forms of flight control. This all increases your chances of success in air-to-air -air and air-to-surface missions. High performance or high perfection in combat was achieved by combining an extremely powerful and lightweight impeller with a sleek, incorporating numerous aerodynamic、uh, innovations, new cockpits, and also new flight systems. The USAF Light Fighter project, whose origins date back to the Vietnam War, officially began in April of 1972. The high American losses in Southeast Asia resulted in part from the fact that none of its planes engaged in the flight or in the fights were skirmishing in close combat against the small and agile MiG. With the Republic F-105s and General Dynamics F-111s had been designed for nuclear attacks, while the McDonald Douglas F-4 Phantom was originally a naval fighter aircraft of the fleet, operating missiles at medium range. Even armed with a cannon and fitted with flaps at the leading edge, which gave it greater maneuverability, the F-4 Phantom's victory ratio turned out to be insignificant on enemy fighters. In order to cope with this situation, the American designers adopted in the next generation of fighters a technology not yet accessible to the Soviet Union. First, the McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle, equipped with the Pratt and Whitney F-100 turbine of 10,807 kg of thrust, was flown on the 27th of August 1972. It was a machine based on modern technology of the F-4, capable of flying from Da Nang in South Vietnam to Hanoi in the north, to dump its auxiliary tanks, and thanks to the thrust-weight ratio of approximately 8.0 and low wing load, surpass any MiG performance. 
the F-15 Eagle also operated at night and under any weather condition due to the use of a very advanced radar. Its armaments included semi-active AIM-7 Sparrow missiles. Still, the McDonald Douglas Hunt was not the ideal plane. Easy to identify at a distance and costly, the F-15 Eagle would need many victories in combat under numerical in inferiority to justify its choice. Studies have indicated that the technological sophistication of this aircraft would not compensate for the greater amount of Soviet fighter aircraft. In addition, the United States had delayed the development of its high firepower and air-to-air -air missiles, and the USAF did not allow for changes in combat rules that required visual identification of the targets with these sophisticated weapons. The decision was to start exploring the various technologies that could be used in a future light hunting. To that end, in April of 1972, the US Air Force selected General Dynamics and Northrop, authorizing each to develop two prototypes. The first designated the GDYF-16, left uh, the hangar in Fort Worth in December of 1973, and took off on February the 2nd, 1974. In May of that year, the second prototype of the YF-16 was also ready, and Northrop's competitor, the YF-17, flew in early June and in August of 1974. The general idea adopted by the two companies was to produce a low-cost, lightweight, lightweight fighter that would incorporate major advances in terms of continuous curves, acceleration, and also climb rate. The Harrow should not present dangerous driving characteristics in tight corners or at high angles of attack. The pilot needed to have an excellent field of view and a cockpit design to prove good G-tolerance. As a basic weapon, the aircraft would carry only one M61 Gatling cannon and two AIM-9 Sidewinders. The design approaches of the two companies were quite similar in some respects. Both endowed their bubble bonnet airplanes following the tradition of the F-86 Sabre and accepted the downside of aerodynamic drag for better visibility in the back. General Dynamics went further than Northrop, fudged bonnet and windshield in one piece, eliminating the blind angle caused by the frame. Both designs received high G-force high G cockpits, with a higher inclination of the seat backs and higher rudder pedals, which was an idea already used in the British Spitfire, which had an extra pair of pedals for combat. Again, General Dynamics moved ahead of the competitor by putting the seat of its YF-16 with a 30-degree tilt and a sideways-mounted stick instead of conventional stick. This provided the pilots with a right-arm support during the maneuvers. General Dynamics adopted a Pratt & Whitney F-100 turbofan similar to the F-15 Eagle for propulsion of its device believing that a single turbine would result in a larger, lighter, less expensive aircraft. Northrop, a traditional manufacturer of biretas, the F-5 and T-38, for example, opted for a pair of General Electric YJ-101 impellers, 6,712 kgs of thrust, seeking competitiveness in weight and cost. The YJ-101, slightly shorter than the F-100, which allowed it to hide it behind the fuel tanks, also had the advantage of reducing post-burner use by virtue of its more regular thrust characteristics. As no Mach 2 speed was required, the two companies opted for, single, for simple air intakes, designed to operate under high angles of attack, properly protected by the fuselage. General Dynamics located the only outlet on the underside of the plane, while Northrop placed its two outlets laterally under root extensions at the leading edge, which is also present on the uh, competitor's handsets. And that's where the article ends, which is a little bit abrupt, but that's what happens when you just copy and paste information. At the same time, when it comes to these specifications, Obviously, the vehicle could carry a lot of different armaments and weapons, 
which would be really nice, some bombs, some edge ground missiles, even some special ones, uh, which would be quite interesting. And luckily, um, when we have a look at it in general, it should be able to carry most of the weapons that people are used to. The main thing is this will be a true air superiority fighter with access to aim nines, access to a pretty nice gun, and also access to stuff such as bombs, rockets, and even other areas in nine separate points. As always, thank you for watching. And I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Professor X1718, Orange Tail, Sakoshi Tiger, BRFC15, Teddy, John Ryman, Universe A, Eugene's Terry, Ambrosius McClellan, Daniel Stanton, Martinez, B. Young, and then Carl Kinn, Bereen, Lafouche, and also Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.